Welcome everyone to the Flood Modeling Technologies webinar. My name is Michael Crenshaw with XP Solutions, I'm a product manager for stormwater and flooding products. And today I want to be talking about several points about flood modeling technology. We have several topics to discuss. These are just a few that from presentations and conferences around the country have come issues that we'd like to point out and make some points of clarification and add some more information to. So we'll discuss some notes about modeling, simulation, calibration, and the comparison of models. This topic stems from there being several products on the market that discuss modeling and simulation. Many of those have been untested or benchmarked and need to be clarified. I also want to touch on the idea of terrain or the digital elevation model that underlies the underlying information for perhaps what our model will be built on. Those terms are used many times, sometimes interchangeably. I want to make a few points to clarify those. Another point that I want to bring up is that not all 2D models are the same. There are different solution schemes and it's important for the user and reviewing agencies to know the difference in those 2D models. Also finally I want to discuss a relatively new concept of direct rainfall. That is applying rainfall directly to the 2D surface or the mesh this is a departure from the long-standing tradition of using lump parameter hydrology. So this is discussing distributed runoff and transmission losses. There are several more topics that have been hot issues at various conferences and discussions that perhaps at a future time we'll be able to discuss those in detail. A quick background on the XP a solution software, of course, we're talking about modeling for wastewater, stormwater, and flooding. Uh, there are a variety of, of software packages out there. XP is a graphical user interface with analytical engines, and that's important to point out. There are several engines that are out on the market that don't necessarily have a graphical user interface. Uh, XP one-dimensional model in Swim and Storm has been around for a long time. Analytical engine that solves the uh, complete St. Bernard equations are, are fully dynamic flow as we like to refer to it. And the two-dimensional analytical engine is two-flow. Um, two-flow, of course, stands for two-dimensional unsteady flow. It's been around for 20 years at least and has been embedded in XP as XP2D. So some of you may have seen or heard things about two flow and things it can do and th that is embedded in a one dimensional um, uh, user interface, graphic user interface package of XP Swim and Storm. And we have a few models we'll use to, to point out some of that. And some of the, just some of the uses real quick that this can be applied to and this is a limited list, there's more that can be added to this list. But just so you get the idea of what we're talking about and specifically drainage and drainage issues will be the examples that we reference in this discussion. So a little bit about models. A lot of us as uh, in, in, in science classrooms have seen posters and things that depict the water cycle and certainly as as practitioners, as engineers, we're conscientious of that and aware of what all goes on. What I'm trying to point out here is the, and rather we're thinking of it conceptually in a science classroom or as in the bottom right part of the slide depicts research data collection that's going on to, to get various aspects of that quantified and what are those numbers and, and parameters and aspects of things that we're trying to piece together and we translate that in some 
way that we, as best we can, to take those very complex processes of nature and we try to, to build a model, try to put it together, as illustrated with this somewhat crazy diagram, but I think you get the idea. So 2D models have added a, an additional dimension of complexity to that. We're not referring to having to wear special glasses or goggles to do our models anymore, but it's a certainly an evolving case. So when we look at the idea of talking about more complexity and building a model, we're building a, a representation of something. We know it's not the real thing, but it's a, a best effort at representing a real natural process that takes place. Some of you may have seen or are aware of the scale model of the Mississippi River that was at, in Vicksburg, the Coors Research Group there. And we're not talking about physical models. They have their place, but not every system or analysis uh, can we build a physical model of. And so the idea, and this was presented a few weeks ago in uh, FMA Sacramento in September this year, a uh, professor from the University of California, Davis, uh, Bill Flinner, presented this slide, and I thought it, it captured the idea so well. We know the physical reality, things we see maybe into, intuitively know or think takes place, and we build a theoretical model from that of how how it works, and we know that there's some assumptions that are made, maybe perhaps uh, that can't be quantified, but we do our best and we try to translate that to some kind of mathematical representation from the theory. And then in order to actually put it into practice to solve the math, to get the prediction or the simulation, we come up with some solution method, typically solved with uh, computers, obviously, in our present time, and so we get a theoretical numerical solution to what we otherwise know as a physical reality. So we know that there's several leaps and not all of the complexity gets carried across and some simplification has to take place. So when we talk about a model, we have to immediately know that it's leaving some things out and it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. So when we take all that code and soft and, and put it into that numerical solution, and then it has to go in in some way to be used for, by users. It goes into some software, some dialogues, some um, screen. We input data, do the simulation, and then are looking at some output or some numerical results from that. And there's all sorts of assumptions made along the way in each of those steps of that process. We have to remind ourselves from time to time that it is just a model, that it's not perfect, that it has to be critically looked at many times. And when we get to later on in the discussion talking about the 2D, not all 2D models are the same, I want to come back to, to this point a little bit. So so that we've covered this thoroughly. But just as, as engineers and practitioners in this field, we need to continually remind ourselves that just because we have an overload of data, in some cases, for our models, it's not always a reflection of the quality or the model that is representing that. Models are not perfect. So we'll go on to the second point. And that is to talk about uh, terrain, and in particular, as it relates to the two-dimensional hydraulic model. We all remember the good old days when all we had, our best hope for any kind of terrain information was either to send the surveyor out to collect data, or if we were doing watershed studies, large scales, we obviously couldn't go survey everything. So we would grab our trusty USGS quad maps, and they were good, 10-foot uh, contours, most places, and we could delineate watersheds, we could see the blue lines, that sort of thing, and take areas from it, and generally use those as an approach to our beginning approach 
to a watershed study. Nowadays, we've we've come a long way, as we say, and uh, we got 30 meter DEMs. Well, they have their limitations, but they were allowed us to do some automated processing on that terrain to find an automated way to look for drainage areas to get um, calculations, to get weighted curve numbers, soil values, etc. Well, that didn't last long before we see kind of today where we're at with the advent of some kind of uh, LIDAR type data that gathers much more data, perhaps more accurate, maybe, maybe not, but we get a lot more information and it creates these data points and it can go from, from very sparse collection of data to very, very dense amounts of information and data points. This too is not perfect, very helpful in times, but it has to be mode or, or perhaps we want bare earth um, information and not the tops of trees and buildings and cars and that sort of thing. So there's some manipulation that has to be done before that data is, can be just used and should of course never be blindly used. And now we have enormous amounts of point data to the degree that we can see the definition and, and resolution just from this amount of information that we've never been able to, to see before has been used for, of course, transportation projects and flood studies where they use this to actually get uh, an approximation of finished floors, finished floor elevations for homes. So the data is, has become more and more plentiful. How does it fit into our model is the question. Where, where do we say this is enough or this is too much? And if we have this amount of data, do we think that it should just directly carry over, especially in a two-dimensional hydraulic model that looks at surface data? So let's talk about that a little bit. I have a sequence of slides here to sort of illustrate this point. This is a typical urban area with some water features and an open channel. There are some homes. This is just aerial imagery we start with, so we know where we're at. We can look at this wonderful high resolution image. We take terrain data which came from LIDAR, maybe one or two foot spacing, really good LIDAR information. We're very confident about it. it tells us a lot of information. So we take that imagery that we had, we take this LIDAR terrain data, we combine the two together, and we have a compilation of information now and we begin to see how we could use this in the model and various benefits that come from this. So if we wanted to do a two-dimensional hydraulic model of this and we go into our modeling system and we put a mesh over that, a grid that we want the two-dimensional model to use to calculate its hydraulics. So we'll take an area, zoom in and to this area so we know there's quite a bit of elevation change, some homes, and of course a very important drainage feature that we want to make sure is considered in the model. And looking at the resolution of the 2D surface, we see that it's fairly small grids, in this case 10 feet by 10 feet squares. It could be triangles. Um, or it could be irregular grids, say rhombus. Either, either way, it, it is this principle that we're, I'm pointing out here is the same. Look, as we then look at the elevations that are turned on, the red dot inside that grid, each one of those cells has taken an elevation. And they've taken that elevation from the digital terrain model that is, is underlying this. So another way of, of illustrating this is we have a combination of data, the aerial imagery, some points from LIDAR, from those points a surface was built and from that surface the two-dimensional model obtains 
an elevation. In most models that are being used today, at least in the US, that are taking that mesh, and this slide is just illustrating how you can see there's a difference from the terrain surface data and the 2D mesh data. So for example, in the center of the slide, you see there's multiple faces of the underlying digital terrain model, the 10. However, inside one of those cells, the 2D calculation, and again, rather this was a, in this case, we're looking at a fixed mesh. It could be a triangular mesh, or it could be some uh, irregular uh, square mesh or combination of those three could all exist in the same model, but they're all in principle doing this very same thing, not using every one of those data points. And so there's immediately a disconnect between what we imagine we see by looking at the aerial imagery where we look at perhaps um, a hedgerow that has been created or a, a curb or a small parapet wall uh, constructed by an individual trying to prevent water from running, uh, draining onto their lot, whatever the case may be. We have to know when we use the model that we look at the surface that we're looking at multiple versions or iterations that are a steps away from reality, steps away from the six inch pixel uh, uh, imagery that we may be looking at where we can see, zoom in and see all the definition However, the 2D mesh, the 2D grid surface, what the, the 2D hydraulic engine is going to use to calculate flow, unconfined flow across that cell, is not using all of those data points. And this, and this, is the tr this would be true whether it was an irregular mesh or a fixed mesh or a combination of those two. Every one of the surface faces is not necessarily a two-dimensional hydraulic calculation phase. And as you can see, as illustrated by this picture, picture uh, computation time would be um, quite high on this if that were the case. So what we do is we try to enhance somehow the 2D grid surface, not the terrain model, the underlying terrain model, but the 2D grid. If we want, going back to this slide, to have a wall, say in the middle of this mesh, there was a privacy fence and they had built, a, unbeknownst to anybody, a three foot high concrete wall in the back of their lot, and they wanted to represent that, and we discovered it in, in field reconnaissance as we go to the field like good engineers and look at everything before we model it, and we'd realized this in, in the terrain, it needs to be reflected in the 2D calculations. I want to enhance my 2D grid to see that. I've not changed the surface model, the DTM, but I can instruct the 2D calculations to see that. In XP we do that through a number of, of avenues. There's a gully which would depress uh, an area, a ridge line that would raise it. Uh, we can do a fill area which might be represent home with a certain finished floor elevation. It might be a dynamic elevation shape. If you're in Houston and you have privacy fences that have to collapse after so many feet of water on them, whatever the case is, um, there's various enhancements that can be, that, that force the two-dimensional hydraulic calculations to honor. Don't necessarily, and, and in this case, do not change the underlying uh, terrain. The takeaway from this is there are two separate things, generally speaking, in the models. And of course, that DTM quality is very important. The better the terrain, um, the better uh, the calculations, uh, and very poor uh, digital terrain quality data may not yield the results that we think we ought to get. In terms of the model itself, um, modeling these features, uh, you have to look and see, did it, did it depict what I'm trying to model, the definition that I'm trying to get? Does it see the bank? Does it see the undulations of the channel? Does it uh, represent, uh, from a two-dimensional model, cell? Rather, again, rather that's a 
fixed grid or triangular or combination of. Is my cell size uh, capturing what I want to capture? And perhaps at a very large cell size, we may use it as a screening tool. When we get into areas of complexity, decrease that, catch that definition that we're that areas that we're wanting to get more um, definition in. So, just some some notes about the DTM. Again, we're seeing various questions and and uh, different ideas around the country as we're making presentations, and this is kind of a, a regurgitation of some of those issues that are that are out there. Not only with realizing that it's just a model and that us engineers can't get too carried away with it and also that uh, the difference between the 2D surface that's being calculated and our actual underlying terrain model. I want to point out and this is a result again of some international work that's been done and FEMA is looking at this as well. What What is in the two-dimensional models? There are a number of models that are available, many of them uh, academic. What are the underlying assumptions? Is it supported? Is it documented? There are several important criteria that we as practitioners need to understand and, and think about when looking at a model. And different models were built for different purposes. So just a, a quick rehash, I'm sure this is familiar with most of you, but the two-dimensional model again is becoming quite common. Maybe if you've been to some floodplain management conferences recently you've seen more and more presentations talking about two-dimensional hydraulic modeling. It is a great tool. It does give some great uh, results for shallow overland flow. Um, shallow being relative. Uh, we're talking m uh, most are can handle any inland flows, rivers that we have uh, shallow is a relative term, so you might think of shallow be inland, deep would be ocean, deep ocean, so that may be a good way to think of that. Um, graphics, mapping, of course, animated replays. And we all know the limitations, or should at least know the limitations of two-dimensional modeling. We should know the limitations of one-dimensional modeling. And so the 2D model is a good tool for practitioners to use, and especially knowing when the 1D doesn't fit the undefined flow paths, multiple flow paths, um, etc. So, so little, little more information. What we're talking about, of course, is some grid or some, uh, whether it's fixed grid or flexible or uh, uh, squares or triangles, whatever it is. It's most of them out there on the market are doing the same thing. They're taking us uh, an elevation point. That is an average point. Again, it, not all of the little uh, shots, if you will, that may have been captured for an area, it takes just one of those elevations and uses that and solves the equations for two-dimensional flow. And we know there are times when it needs to be two-dimensional flow, when, the, when it is not, uh, when it goes beyond and, and we've surpassed the limitations of 1D, the assumption that all flow is normal to the cross section and all the assumptions that go along with that. In most cases, we find various applications of dam breach, levee breach, uh, lots of urbanized flooding is best characterized by a combination of one dimensional and two dimensional uh, flow. And along the theme of not all 2D models are the same, we would would be remiss if we didn't point out some of the equations and get excited about that and everything that's calculated into that and all the terms that go into that. As we pointed out earlier, this all then has to be the theory, has to be translated to code, and some things could be lost maybe some, uh, in terms of uh, variables that are important. Some models solve the math differently and that needs to be considered as well, verified and validated. So in XP 2D we have of course two flow we've mentioned. We're looking at um, flow in the X and the Y plane. That allows us to average the, the depth and of course the uh, result of that is rather and 
we get depth grids, velocity grids, all the information that is very valuable for an, in a number of uses. And of course, that's FEMA approved as well. So not all 2D models are the same. And the point we're trying to make here is that you know, if you're using a piece of software, whether you got it for free or bought it or however, however came by it, know what's under the hood. Look and see maybe if it's really fast and you're getting different results, it may not be solving the two-dimensional shallow water equations. There are models on the market that just use the diffusion wave equation, which neglects some pretty important terms in especially river flooding and urban flooding. Maybe it's just a volume spreading algorithm. This may be a great tool for screening level hazard analysis, um, but maybe if you're looking at details and needing more information, just, just know that volume spreading algorithms are not solving the, the math, uh, the theory of two-dimensional hydraulics. And some others do variations on that. But what terms are critical? And, and though that's, that's the important thing we have to ask ourselves, especially in urban flooding or areas of population, and that, of course, would be a great concern for health, safety, welfare. And just as the bottom bullet point, I uh, want to make a point about that, just because something can be downloaded free from the internet, maybe even it's academic, but a lot of things that are, have to be made available, we don't know the underlying assumptions. Maybe they're not documented, maybe it's not supported, um, and nobody's there to even answer your questions when you have questions about how it handles certain assumptions that it encounters in the model. I know many of you have, have run into this in instances, and uh, that's just a word of caution, that things that may be out there that are um, not doing the, the proper solution or we're just unaware of what it's doing certainly want to be cautious and wouldn't want to use a tool we didn't know. So what are those important factors? And I won't go through all this, obviously, but some of them more important than others. And it turns out that there's a handful that typical inland flooding, um, many times, not always, but many times some of these terms drop out. There's no. Um, and there are softwares out there that presume this is the case. They presume or it's prescribed or it's assumed and coded into the software that these are neglected. That could be a good assumption, but it may not be for your model, for your instance. And that's important for you to know. So what does the 2D scheme solve? And that's important to know. So we'll move on to one last topic and then perhaps have some time to, to cover some questions. I want to talk a little bit about direct rainfall on 2D surfaces. So we've talked about a model and how limited that is, and it's not exact. We've talked about two-dimensional hydraulics, making sure we know what's under the hood, that it's doing the full uh, mathematical solution of the St. Bernard equation, and then how is that coded? How does the scheme solve? Those are all important, very important in terms of affecting our answer and outcome results. This last topic has just come on of late as software developers have added ability and, and capabilities in software. So I want to talk about direct rainfall or applying the, the rain directly to the mesh. Hydrology, of course, is, is a complex process. And to characterize it mathematically, has to account for an enormous amount of interaction and things going on in the natural environment. Can all of that be captured into a model? Probably not, at least uh, not to where we would want it to be maybe, and, and NASA continues to collect data and we continue to do studies and, and PhDs continue to do thesis on this, et, et cetera, but we're still just approximating this very very elaborate, complex environmental process. And so our models, even though we think we've got it pretty close, we know there's an enormous amount of, of leeway in this. 
in the background, just a little bit of background before we get into the direct rainfall, where most of us are familiar with lump parameter hydrology, where we delineate a watershed. It may have that sort of teardrop look. At the end of it, there's a point where we're going to do a calculation. Upstream of that point, we just lump all the parameters together and get a hydrograph. This slide sort of illustrates that hydrograph coming in at the top right of the picture. We do our hydraulic calculations. At the bottom end comes out another hydrograph. Maybe it has less of a peak because there's been some attenuation in the natural stream along the way. And that's all can be done in XP and is very common and, and many of us are familiar with that. In fact, XP has an enormous number of, of methods to get to that point to where we have that hydrograph for the lump parameter. Um, one of the, the newer approaches has been to take rainfall and put directly on each cell of that two-dimensional hydraulic mesh. And this is a great tool and it can be used in a lot of different cases and areas and instances and simulate uh, the idea that we think we see rain falling in areas building up moving down the watershed before it actually maybe gets to the river and we can see that so what's happening in direct rainfall of course we know we have an underlying surface we take our two-dimensional mesh grid system and we apply some some rain to it. Maybe we start with a, a rainfall profile and that builds uh, as, the, as time in the simulation continues it peaks and then it has some receding portion. We know there's a lot of processes that happen as water moves over the surface. There's some initial loss, there's some continuing losses, there may be uh, karst topography that it removes water from the surface. Many, many complex interactions that we know take place, including the surface roughness. In each of these points, just look at how much we've accumulated on our assumptions now. Not necessarily error, I won't use that term, but just our assumptions. Look, we've generalized the land surface. We know that that's not perfect, it's close, it may be very high resolution in LIDAR even, but it's still just a representation of it. Uh, rain, we know that rain is can be very unique for geographical areas, for in each different storm even, the pattern and distribution and centering and all of the other elements of rain itself. Uh, then when the rain hits the ground, how does it move? What are the losses like? How is the effect of it in a, in a rain uh, on different surfaces? We can look at a parking lot perhaps that's paved and Im impervious and water moves off very quickly. We look at another area, perhaps a park or an open land, open space, and depending on the soils and the grasses and the tree canopy, all of these things. So we, we've got enormous amounts of assumptions that we've made along the way to get to this point and then we can apply that rainfall directly to the surface so we're not doing our lumped parameter hydrology. We now have got some rainfall. We're going to use a method at least to do some initial and continuing losses based on um, some methods that we have. And then as water builds up in each one of these two-dimensional cells, we're going to let the model, the hydraulics then, solve the hydrology portion for us. So we take in some rainfall from a variety of different formats and use that. We're going to use some losses. We know there are some losses um, for the two-dimensional portion. The losses are limited to the green amped, or excuse me, initial and continuing loss for infiltration and then the green amped method um, as well can be specified now for two-dimensional direct rainfall. So that's important. Um, there's a variety of, of ways to look at that infiltration in the green amped method. We look at survey, uh, surface imperviousness, soil characteristics, the infiltration rate, um, different methods for areas that dry out, uh, saturation depth, and 
and this is built into uh, XP2D now, and you can apply this with direct rainfall on the mesh using this green amped method for losses and infiltration. And um, it accounts for, and, and takes into account rather, excuse me, it's based on the surface imperviousness, soil capacity, um, and of course saturation depth. So all of that can be set up with 2D, two-dimensional uh, land use categories. And these screenshots show directly from the software the ability to use the rainfall abstraction, which would be just a basic take some of the rainfall out by an initial and a continuing loss. The recently added losses through infiltration using the green amped calculations or the, the initial and continuing loss method. So there's a couple of ways to do losses. But again, this is a departure from our traditional lumped parameter hydrology how much literature has been done, research, calibration, validation of this approach is just beginning. So we should take that under advisement as we use this for a model and results, etc. So the direct rainfall then uh, can be applied across multiple grid sizes as well in XP2D. We have the ability to have multiple domains. So you can have in each two-dimensional domain, you could have a different grid size. This slide illustrates that. There's a one grid size uh, for one bank of a channel. There's a different grid size for the other bank. The channel itself is a much more higher resolution grid to capture the unique features in the channel itself. And so XP2D has the multiple domains in that as well. All right, just a, a summary of some of the things we've talked about. This is a little bit of humor as well. Recently, this quote uh, couldn't resist. All models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think that's a good dose of reality for us if we want to pinch ourselves every now and then to remind ourselves that we're using these tools and they certainly have a lot of assumptions. We know those assumptions. The idea of verify means that we know what it's doing under the hood. We're not blindly putting in things and getting out answers. Um, and calibrate. Didn't touch on again. There's a lot of topics that we didn't touch on that would be great for webinar discussions. And our industry overall as practitioners needs to, to discuss more and more openly one especially is calibrate. It's very difficult stormwater modeling, especially urban settings where there's not a lot of reporting of information. There's um, anecdotal information. Maybe we have high water marks after the fact. Um, again, is is the variables in the rain? Is the variables in the runoff? Is the variable in the the way the model calculates and solves the math? And that's the calibration. And then validate that by taking and applying it in other areas. So if we believe the end value is what it is, maybe we take that same model to another area with a similar end value and do we get a similar result perhaps if as we back back through that process of verifying, calibrating, and validating. Uh, we also drilled on a little bit the terrain and the 2D surface are not the same. So just um, Keep that in mind. Perhaps um, no, no, no big surprise here. But if you're familiar with GIS and you have 30 meter DEMs and somebody creates one foot contour map for you, from that it can be done. It's still only a 30 meter DEM, and <laughs> those aren't really one foot contours. But the the, the process can be done and we have to use caution in, in a similar, in an analogous kind of way. We have to realize the real world, the physical reality is one thing. Our summation of that in theory is something else. And try to get close, but it's not exact. And our 2D surface is not the terrain. We also pointed out that not all 2D hydraulic models are the same. This is important 
to know uh, the tool you're using, what is it solving. In the case of, of XP, one-dimensional is very robust, full dynamic solution. The two-dimensional has been uh, a similar uh, effort put in to verify it, mathematically tested, benchmarked internationally, and that's important to know. Direct rainfall can be a useful tool, um, but again, begin to do some literature research, find that there's very, very little out there on this, and just use it with caution. But it can be a very useful tool, especially in the beginning of a project, screening tool, looking for hot spots, etc., and doing early analysis. And that, I believe, is all the presentation slides we have for today. So, and I thank you for attending today, and have a good day.